Good afternoon and welcome to Inside Story. Inside Story is a weekly magazine program produced by the Agency for Public Information which highlights government's plans, projects and policies at work in your community. On today's program, we'll talk sports, in particular cricket with Sporting Ambassador Michael Thaddeus Findlay. The Ministry of Education, National Reconciliation and Information hosts another science fair in association with VINLEC. We'll bring you all the interviews and projects with the young and upcoming scientists. And local gospel artist Stacy Little gives back to the Redemption Shops community through her latest project dubbed Little Voices. We'll be back in a moment. <music> St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Thank you for staying with us. Welcome back to our program. Sporting Ambassador Michael Thaddeus Finley views his new role as Sporting Ambassador as an opportunity to give back. He made a call for other sporting and cultural ambassadors to adopt a similar approach in an effort to positively mold the minds of the nation's youth. Here's more. Not many of us will have an opportunity to have a street or a building named after us. This cannot be said of my next guest, Michael Thaddeus Findlay, Sporting Ambassador in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In fact, today's interview has been filmed at the Michael Findlay Pavilion. For the next few minutes, we'll talk cricket, we'll talk sports. Basil Dolivier is down here at Long Lake, but he's got no chance of cutting that off. Lake buys, flicking Finlay's pad on the way through. Great test of temperament, this on both sides. England suddenly back in the game with a real chance. Two wickets falling for nine runs. Nine! Got him! Yes, put behind Alan Knott. And look at the jubilation from the England side. What a turnabout, 219 for 3, 224. I'm just another person, another Vincentian, another West Indian. I, God has given me some talent, some sporting talent. I think I have utilized it to the best of my ability. It has taken me around the world. Uh, I won't say it has won me fame and fortune because there is no fortune in sports uh, in St. Vincent and even in the Caribbean uh, at the moment, uh, not much anyhow. Uh, it's a little different these days to when we played. Uh, so I would like to, to look at myself as just an ordinary Vincentian uh, who has had some talent and has utilized that talent. Well, you were selected to tour with the West Indies cricket team to Australia back in 1968 and you had your first test match at Lords in London in 1969. Walk that, us through that moment. That's a long time ago. I mean, at this age, you know, memory lapses. <laughs> but yes, uh, in 1968 I um, toured with the West Indies team to Australia and New Zealand and then we went to England uh, just a couple of weeks after we came home for a brief period and then we went to England and this way I had my first test at Lords and then um, I played two test matches in England on that tour, one at Lords uh, where I made my debut and then at Leeds in the third test, we still played three test matches on that tour. The first was at um, Old Trafford in Manchester and uh, then I played most of the other test matches in the Caribbean, in fact all the other test matches in the Caribbean uh, against teams like India and New Zealand and Australia. What sort of results, uh, what, what sort of results? I suppose that was in the heyday when West Indies was doing very well. Uh, part of it was in the heyday. Uh, when, when, when I went to Australia in 68, uh, Australia, New Zealand 68, 69, a lot of the stars at that time were on the other side of the hill and in fact the West Indies should have started to rebuild. Uh, people like Seymour Nurse, uh, although he played very well in New Zealand after, uh, he had a bad tour of Australia 
uh, Rohan Kanai, yeah, Pete already, Lance Gibbs, Wes Hall, Charlie Griffith. Those were the big names in West Indies cricket in those days. And uh, people like Charlie Davis, Roy Fredericks, Stephen Kamash, and I were the newcomers, Clive Lloyd, uh, on that tour. Well, I, don't, I need not say well, what happened to the others. People like Clive Lloyd has, has risen to the heights of, of, of his career, um, skipping the West Indies and, and, and leading that, that fantastic West Indies team. Uh, the others came after my time, people like Andy Roberts and, 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 and Dave Richards. And, uh, although I played with them in 1976 on that tour of England, uh, that's when we mauled England. Uh, and what, one of the, the, the things that drove us was our desire to become a top cricketing nation. You know, England dominated cricket in those days. England and Australia. Well, South Africa was out because of apartheid. And so it was England and Australia. And countries like New Zealand uh, were the minnows of, of cricket. India, even India and, and Pakistan. Uh, but really, the, the three big, big guns were Australia, England and the West Indies. West Indies had just come off an, an excellent tour of Australia in 1960 on the Frank Warrell. Uh, and they played such, such brilliant cricket that when they were leaving Melbourne at the end of the tour, millions of Australians turned out to give them a ticket. A, a farewell. The streets of Melbourne were lined with, with, with thousands and millions of Australians bidding farewell to the West Indies team. And when we went back in 60, it was a different colour because a lot of the stars were at that time fading. So we didn't have this sort of results. That, that, that we wanted, but um, that, that changed again um, from the, the, the 1970s, late mid to late 1970s, when under Clive Lloyd um, they became champions of the world and, and, were, and remained the champions for about 15 years. It was a fantastic period for West Indies cricket. We reigned supreme and, and that is because, you know, there was this desire, there was this desire to prove to the rest of the world that even though we are from a small region like the Caribbean, from a number of islands which are probably just dots on the, on the map, that we had sufficient talent to hold our own and to dominate cricket in the world, which, which we did. And that drove us. Uh, I remember very well in 1976, when we got to England, Tony Gregg uh, was the captain of the England team. And Tony Gregg said he would make the West Indies grovel. And that angered us. But we were not angry in our response in terms of physical anger. We, we, we let that show itself in our performance. We went out on the field and we decided we are going to show these people what cricket is about, who we are. And, and that, that was the start of a great period for West Indies cricket. Uh, similarly with the Combined Islands, because I came from a background of St. Vincent, uh, Winnowed Islands, Combined Islands, and we were underdogs also. When we started uh, in the Shell Shield, it was in those days, in 1966, we were, we were battered virtually in, in almost every game. In fact, the situation was so bad as far as I'm concerned that, you know, most of the top journalists in those days were from the large territories. And when they were previewing the Shell Shield, it was a story something like this. Well, the Combined Islands are going to play Jamaica in Kingston at Sabina Park. That's 16 points for Jamaica. They go next to Trinidad where they play Trinidad and Tobago, 16 points. So before a ball was bowled in the Shell Shield, the pundits and the journalists had assessed the competition and didn't give the Kamban Islands a chance to even win a single game. That too drove us up the wall. And we decided that we have got to change the thinking of these people. 
And so we developed a team spirit, a camaraderie, uh, a desire to excel, which we did in the end and we produced the excellent stars, Sir Viv Richards, Sir Andy Roberts, uh, Sir Kurt Lee Ambrose, he came later, um, Sir, Sir Richie Richardson, you know, and others. But they, they all had their beginnings in the combined islands. And um, I, I, I was so delighted to be part of that team. The, the, even, you know, sometimes people don't understand what they do to others. Uh, even our own people in the combined islands sometimes treated us as underdogs. I remember when we played, if we were playing in St. Lucia, and we were playing against Barbados, the Barbados team would be put at the top hotel. The combined islands at the guest house. Sometimes the rooms weren't even big enough to hold your foot of beer. And no matter how much you complained, they never bothered us. But I suppose one had to accept that because we were the underdogs. We won the joint cards, we became the joint cards later. And that is because we were convinced that that, that was a drove us. Let us prove to these people that we are as good as any. Oh, we lost a number of games as we started. But then we began to win. We beat Guyana in Dominica, we beat Barbados somewhere else. And I, I, I remember we played a match at um, Kensington Oval against uh, Barbados. In those days, the Barbados pitch was very quick. Any captain that won the toss didn't have to think. He would put the team into back because the first morning of that match, the ball was going to fly about, moving like a pace. And Andy Roberts was in his peak. Andy had just started off his career. Norbert Phillips was on the team. Hugo, left hand fast ball for Antigua, was on the team. And Andy Roberts terrorized those Barbadian batsmen. The only guy who stood up, and he stood up because Hollis King was a brave human being. And Collis got to the wicket and he decided he was going to swing his bat. And that's what he did. And he got a few edges, he got a few good hits and so on. So he got some runs. But <laughs> Greenwich, the opening batsman, backpedaled. I remember before the ball was bowled, Greenwich was, Greenwich was on, outside the leg stump to, to negotiate the ball. And this is not God Greenwich, this is the other Greenwich. Uh, so that, that's, what, that's, that's what happened. That was the early stage of our development. And, um, you know, we followed similar pattern of the West Indies team when they became a dominant feature. We also became a force to be reckoned with in West Indies cricket, in what was then those days the Shell Shield. Well, you spoke of uh, some traits that I consider to be rather enviable. Uh, drive, determination, uh, perseverance. But, but there's a story I recall hearing, and that speaks, of course, to the man Michael Thaddeus Finley, your honesty. Uh, that when everybody thought you had captured, you taken 22 wickets and everybody thought that you had taken this wicket and then you, you held up and, and, and you said no, no, that, that wasn't it. If you can just tell us about that. I, 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 I play the game and I perform and there are certain things, certain principles that I expect in the game. I don't expect that a batsman will hit the ball and not walk. I don't expect that a fielder would miss a catch and claim a catch. So this happened in, in Barbados at Kensington Nova. We were playing against uh, New Zealand in 1972. Glenn Turner was the leading batsman for New Zealand. He was in fact an opening batsman. He had been making a lot of runs against us that, in that series. And I think it was Van Burn Holder who was bowling from, from the far end. Sagafi Sobers now, he was the captain. And Holder bowled a ball, not, not, not Jason Holder, Van Burn Holder. He bowled a ball down the leg side and Turner nicked it. And I flew and took the catch. But it was really wide of me. And as I hit the ground, the ball dropped out of my glove. But nobody saw it. But I knew that had happened. So the umpire gave Turner out and Turner started to go. So I, I, I said to, to Gary, Skipper, um, I didn't take the catch for you. 
and, and Gary himself is a very fair cricketer. And Gary told the umpire, and they called um, Turner back to bat. But <laughs> when we got in the dressing room at the end of the, <laughs> the session, Roy Fredericks said, but you must be the damn Pope. <laughs> and that name stuck as a nickname in, in this. Up to, up to the last days of Roy Fredericks, whenever he saw me, he said Pope. And there's still a number of people who still call me Pope. Uh, but that was simply that I knew I didn't catch the ball. Um, I don't like anybody to do that to me. So I didn't do it to somebody. I had a good game, that was a very good game because in that game also I made 45 not out. Um, the, the, the New Zealand fast bowlers, were, they had won the toss and put us into that. And the pitch was fast and the ball was moving. And we were losing a lot of wickets. And so we were really in trouble. And I, I joined the captain, Gary, at the crease. And I, I, I said to him, Skip, I'll stay here with you. And <laughs> But, but Gary is a star. Gary is a great batsman. And I, I'm not sure how Gary was thinking. But, you know, I, I was going to remain with him. I was going to let him take the strike and let him take the, the attack to the New Zealand bowlers. Mark you, at that time, um, the New Zealand bowlers were tiring. So the ball wasn't moving about as much as in the earlier, to the earlier batsman. So I got some runs, I got 40 something, I drove the fast bowlers all over the place and so on. I looked good, I batted well. And, and so was got out before me. And I, I maintained that if it hadn't, if, if it hadn't happened, I might have made a hundred. <laughs> so, but I was denied my, my first test hundred. Okay, Mikey, you have actively retired uh, from, from cricket at, at that level, and, and but you have dabbled in, in sport administration, you're into presenting sports. There are lots of things uh, that, that you're doing. Uh, let, let's just concentrate on the administration aspect of, of sports on a whole in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and to a lesser extent the region. Uh, uh, what, what is your take on, on what is happening in sport? And I suppose lots of persons would not forgive me if I don't say in particular cricket, West Indies cricket in particular. <laughs> the, let me touch very briefly first of all on your first question about administration. Uh, I had always been part of administration. When I played here in St. Vincent, I'd been secretary of the St. Vincent and Grandines Cricket Association. And in fact, I served in that capacity on almost every association, the Football Association, what was then the Sports Association, to accommodate the sports which are not uh, represented football, and who are represented those days. So athletics and basketball and so on. That, that embraced the Sports Association. So I was indeed secretary to those associations. So I came, by the time I got to play international cricket, I had a good background, a good understanding of sports administration. And um, uh, in terms of regional administration, I served uh, as, a, as a selector on the West Indies board. Uh, I then went on to become chairman of selectors. Uh, I was uh, also chairman of uh, what the board used to have then was a cricket committee which looked at cricket development and made recommendations for cricket development. I served as chairman of that committee uh, for, for a few years. So, so I've dabbled a bit in administration. Uh, the, the, uh, I'll tell you something. One of the greatest um, honors that, that, that anybody could, could have bestowed on me was West Hall was, was the president of the West Indies Cricket Board. And Wes was leaving the office. And Wes came to me and said, Mike, you should take over the board as president. <laughs> and I, I smiled. I said, Wes, well, thank you very much for the honor. Um, and I'm, I'm deeply honored and humbled that you think that I've got the capacity to do it. But I, I don't think I'm ready. But having said that, Wes and I were great friends. We became great friends in Australia in 1968. He was a senior member of the West Indies team. And he sort of took me under his wings. Um, you know, we, we became very great friends. In fact, he is um, godfather to Ensala. Um, so whenever Wes, he knew a lot of people in Australia because he played professionally in Australia. Uh, so every evening almost, Wes had some dinner to go to or something. So he called my room, he called me youngster. Of course, I was a youngster in those days, eh? <laughs> He didn't call me anything but youngster on that tour. He said, youngster, what are you doing tonight? I said, where's well, nothing? I'm, I'm relaxing. Don't make any plans. We are going to so and so and so. And we met a lot of friends. And Wes has some lovely friends in Australia. Very, very fine people. 
And even now, Wes and I are great friends. When Wes with Wes was with um, what was then Cabon Wireless, and he would come across St. Vincent. He still had hotel. He would call me, Mike. I'm coming along tomorrow. So and so and so and so. Meet Wes and we. After work evening, we go up at Wes. I go up at Wes. And Wes and I will be there talking till 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning. And Wes is a good talker. Eh? When you start to talk with Wes, he doesn't stop. So when I, when I look at the time, I say, Wes, it's 3 o'clock in the He said, man, where are you, man? Where are you going? <laughs> but that, that was the kind of relationship that Wes and I, I built up. It was fantastic. A pavilion was named in your honor at this country's main sporting facility uh, recently in uh, 2017. On the 27th of October, in particular, Prime Minister Gonzalez announced you as one of the sporting ambassadors. And you've been honored by lots of organizations in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and organizations external to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. How does that make you feel to see that your efforts have been rewarded and you're seeing all of this while your eyes are still open? I feel appreciated. Um, in fact, Dion, you know, uh, when I played, I, I was totally committed to sport. And I was telling a friend of mine not too long ago, when he asked me, I haven't seen you at cricket for a while. And I said to him, listen, I have paid my dues. Um, I spent every weekend playing cricket here, there, and everywhere in St. Vincent. Um, not that I neglected my children, but I thought I should, could have spent a little more time with them. In fact, um, I'm indeed honored and humbled that, that so many people have recognized um, the contribution I've made to sports in St. Vincent. I, I feel that all the honors I've received are not for me, Michael Finley only, but for all the fans and my friends and my relatives who have, over my entire life, given me support. I've been great. Um, they've loved me. Um, they've given me support. Uh, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have done everything they could. In other words, you walk down to Kingston and, and, and people say to you, Mike, how are you doing? Enough respect. You know? And that means a lot. So, so whatever I have received in terms of honor is equally for those people who have, without their support, I couldn't have made it. Finally, Mikey, are they the future of cricket, the future of sports in St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Let's deal with St. Vincent and the Grenadines first. I still think that we need to give more recognition to sports and sports development. There's still a feeling among a, a number of people that sports is only by the way. Despite the fact that we've had a number of concessions playing for the West Indies, despite the fact we have a number of athletes who have made it internationally, uh, uh, basketball players, um, men and women, um, O'Donnell Foyle played in the NBA, uh, uh, Neil Williams played for England, Will Slap played for England, these are great achievements, but yet I think the sports person in St. Vincent still has to battle too much to get recognition and not necessarily recognition that he plays football and he plays for his club and he plays well and so on, he scores, goal, he makes runs and so on, but to get a meaningful life out of sport. Uh, let's take Tweety Spence for example. Tweety Spence played a lot of football for St. Vincent. He was a good player. He didn't have the opportunity to go as far as, as he would have wanted, and sure he would have wanted to go and play professional cricket as Chang, professional football as Chang Jack did. Uh, he didn't have that chance. But after Tweety retired from his job with the government of the, at the post office, Tweety was in trouble. And and it is that I'm concerned about. That and I, I made the point um, in, in some program I did that there should be some fund for people like that who um, they've given so much service and, and you're not paid for it. Uh, when, when, when I started to play in the Shell Shield in 1966, I didn't play in 66, I played in 67. You got, uh, I think it was $30 for a match. And those days what we did, because we were playing as combined islands, we had to play uh, two practice matches. The win was against the Leewards. 
and then the team was selected and immediately we went on to play uh, for uh, the combined island so you, you played about 12 days straight of cricket and still you had one or two days rest before you played your, your, your first Shell Shield match. So it's, it's hard work and don't talk about the training and all that. And we played, we, we did all that for the love of the game. We weren't paid. Um, you're talking about not being paid. West Hall told me they went to India with the West Indies team for a pound a day. A pound was $4.80 our currency in those days. And, and you could see, you could see how, how, how that, that, that the revenue base has grown since, and quite rightly so, uh, because um, our four parents worked for a, a, a shilling and, and, and so on a, a day and all that. Now it's a, a big difference, and, and that's understandable. But yet I think that we have to make provisions in St. Vincent for our sports people to be taken care of in a better way. In the, the, the sports physical education and sports division, or there, there are a number of opportunities for them, but still, uh, unfortunately, we haven't reached a level where there's professional sports in St. Vincent. Uh, the, the, the companies, uh, we're still so dependent on sponsorship from the companies, and they're doing their fair job. But I think overall, we need to examine that very closely. Uh, the, you mentioned that um, I was. Uh, recently appointed a local sports ambassador and I, I suggested to the authorities that uh, you know you, you have sports ambassadors who have reached a certain height in their sports. Um, if we want to help in a meaningful way to develop sports, you can get these sports ambassadors to become involved in motivating youngsters at the primary and secondary school. Why not set up a program? Let them go to the schools, it doesn't have to be every day. There are a number of them, so they can schedule the different areas and so on. Let them go and talk to these youngsters and encourage these youngsters because I tell you, the discipline you get from sports takes you throughout life. You need discipline for everything you do. And we have to try to instill in that. As far as West Indies cricket is concerned, we're all sad because the West Indies team has, has fallen so low. I can't understand what's happening because they've got as many officials with them on tour as you have members of the team. There's usually a 15-member, 30-member squad and you probably have uh, seven or eight officials, a coach, an assistant coach, a, 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 a video analyst, a video anal an analyst. Um, and all sorts of people with them. So I'm surprised that still a number of our players, and we see it every time we watch a match, are at that level with so many technical faults. What are these coaches doing? You've got to address it though. And that's why I said we've got to pay attention in the primary schools. That's where it started. I started in the primary schools, uh, at the Trumaka Primary School, where I played for the school and we played in the national primary schools competition, I was able to make the village team and they played cricket all That's how you started. Because you can't wait until they're, they're 17 and 18. At that time, they're set in their ways with some poor techniques which they can't address. Let me take this opportunity to extend all the best to you for the new year. Our presentation will continue after this short break. Mommy, we're busy right now. Just take a snack from the counter. No, Mommy. Those have too much salt in it. Can I have a fruit, please? That's an interesting choice. But where did you learn that? The people on Hellwood. No, Mommy. You want to kill me with high blood pressure? Hellwood says whatever salt you eat for the whole day should not be more than one teaspoon. And that is just for adults, you know. Foods may contain more salt than you think. Reduce salt intake. Welcome back to our second presentation. The Ministry of Education, in collaboration with the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Electricity Services Limited, VINLEC, held its annual science fair and competition at the Methodist Church Hall in capital Kingstown. The exhibits will be on display until Monday, February 5th to give the public an opportunity to view the outstanding presentations put on by the students. Shari John tells us more in this special report.
Andrews. Now you have a very interesting booth here uh, regarding crossbreeding and hybrid animals. Could you tell me a little bit about what you're displaying here and what information you have gathered through your uh, research, etc.? Well, what I have here is a project that is from a close to me. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. As a child, you see things on TV where you see persons having colorful animals and things like that. I'm like, wow, I want to do something great like that one day. So I made a questionnaire, had some persons in my class to see if they knew anything about this. So after I done that, I found the results to be quite surprising. Not a lot of people in my class actually knew what this was. Then I went on and did some other research, find out why they cannot, why crossbreeds cannot actually reproduce for themselves. Um, crossbreeding actually has its advantages and disadvantages. Some advantages, you can, you could make out, you could use um, the animal as a pet. In agriculture, you could use cows, they crossbreed cows, they could produce more meat, better milk. So my disadvantages, people abuse this privilege and neglect animals and things like that, and I don't like that. So this whole product is more to enlighten the people about crossbreeding and the effect of hybrid animals. So effectively you're talking GMOs. Now that is a kind of a controversial topic um, worldwide right now and you've highlighted some advantages which I do see but have you actually seen or taken part in any of the hybridization or do you have plans of becoming a vet etc? What I actually wanted to do was um, crossbreed a herbivore and a carnivore to see if that the car the hybrid will become omnivore, something like that. What kind of animal would you crossbreed? Um, to be honest, I saw this video where somebody crossbred a cat and a rabbit, but they said that it might be a hoax. So I actually wanted to debunk that one for myself. Okay, that one sounds a little mixed up because I don't really see. <laughs> so I actually wanted to see if what well, can actually happen because in the video I saw the um it looked like a cat with like rabbit's feet jumping. I'm like. That looks a little bit too far-fetched. I actually wanted to carry it out and see if something so can actually happen. Well, it's a very peculiar interest and I would say, you know, continue with it. You never know where it will go. Thank you. Hello, Josias. Hi. How are you? Good. What school do you go to? Calico School. Calico Andican School. Well, you have a very nice and very elaborate exhibit here at the science fair. Could you tell me a little bit about your project? Yes, some stuff I have in summer, some stuff I like. But when, when you put the heavy stuff inside the water, they will sing. And when you put the light stuff inside the water, they will feel it. Who helped you with this project? My mommy helped You mommy help you? Yeah. Wow. So some things float and some things sink. Now what is this important for? Do you float when you go to the water, do, to the beach or do you sink? I float. You float? Yeah. I think that's because you can swim, right? Yes. Daniel, you have a very interesting exhibit here. Now this is, what is this? It's a plant pigment project, right? I use to I use I use the plant I use these plants to create these. I use ethanol to extract the color out of these with the red cabbage, carrot, turmeric, better known as saffron, hibiscus, the both hibiscus. I use the red cabbage and the saffron to do this one. Right? First I place a fork in the center of the t-shirt, then I wrap the fork, then I wrap the t-shirt around the fork, then I tie it. To get the pattern of what I, of what I want, then I put I place half the t-shirt in the turmeric and I place the other half in the red cabbage, and then I then I lose it out and th and this gives me this pattern. This one I put the whole shirt inside the whole short t-shirt inside the saffron, and then I lose it out. Then this is what the pattern I got. You say put it in saffron and put it in well turmeric. What is it you're putting it in? Is it a solution with water, boiling water? Yeah, um, yes, please. I boil it. I add heat to the um to the, to the salt that I drain that I, that I got from the um from the from these, right? Then when I I put the um the t-shirt, you know, it's on the fire. 
I'm putting place the t-shirt inside the pot and get the um, get the substance out. They got um put the shirts and um, go to the t-shirt. So what kind of pigments do you think or range of pigments can you extract from maybe a batch of turmeric? Could you go from lighter yellows to darker brown? Yes, please. Based on the potency? Yes, please. Now something like this would have natural um, applications for aga sorry, organic, you know, people who like to do things organically. No. Is that the market or is that the, the, the avenue that you're looking to maybe expand this business or expand this, yes, this creation? Please. Yes, please. I'm indeed trying to do that. Um, that is why I did it for the science fair. I want to show off what I can do and what I want. But to me, well, I want, when I want to be an entrepreneur, right? So this is my first, this is my first creation that I'm, that I'm doing to my business. Okay, wonderful, and I hope a lot of people who are interested in natural stuff patronize you. Thank you so much. Oh, this is a very interesting exhibit. This is an actual miniature, miniature aquaponics station. Now, can you take me through what we're seeing here? Well, basically, this is a demonstration of the aquaponics system. What's happening is that we're trying to grow plants without soil and at the same time we're growing fish what are the benefits of uh, something like this well aquaponics when you use aquaponics it allows your plants roots to get more air and therefore it can absorb more nutrients this means that in the system your plants can grow three to four times faster than in soil okay so could you take me through the setup of uh, i see you have a power um, supply here then you have a pump could you just take me through the general setup of what is happening in front of me well the fish produce waste it's toxic to them but it's nutritious for the plants so the pump will pump the dirty waste water up to the plants okay via this uh, tube and what is it being pumped into right now? What are the plants in right now? What kind of media are they? The grubet. They are in? The grubet. Which contains? Which contains gravel and that's where they are growing on instead of soil. Okay. What kind of plants you have in it right now? Well, we have two types of thyme, uh, pepper and lime. The pepper and lime were grown from seeds and the two types of thyme were grown from stem. Okay, and what is this uh, mechanism here? This is called the bell siphon. Basically what it's doing is it's controlling when the water has to be drained. It's just controlling the level of water so that it doesn't overflow. Okay, so it would basically flood the container and then drain after a period of time? Yes. When the water reaches to a certain level, it will start overflowing into the pipe. The air pressure then creates a vacuum which causes it to drain like it's doing now. So what type of fish, what types of fish do you imagine that this, um, this system could basically house in order to be something self-sustaining etc etc? Well for miniature aquaponic systems we're using sawtails um, if you want to do it on an industrial size, you can use fish like tilapia so that you can eat it. Wonderful, thank you so much. You're welcome. Sure. I see you have a very elaborate um, exhibit here. Could you take me through what we're seeing? Okay. This is a home and dehydrator. It is a device that removes moisture to help to to help in preservation of the fruit because in the season for these fruits it, most of them go to waste because they have not been used so to prevent that you can dehydrate them and make them last all season long okay so is it just specifically for preservation or do you have any other reason for I mean dehydrating fruit maybe kids like fruits yeah I also want to do this because it is very tasty and I want people to stop eating oily foods, foods and chemically processed foods and start eating fruits. 
could you take me through the setup of the system uh how did you build this i don't know it looks like a compartment are you able to open it now or give me a demonstration yes you, you need an size cardboard it doesn't really matter so when you have the cardboard the first thing you want to do is line it with glue so that you can put the foil paper on it and you can also use duct tape to secure the foil paper and you also need aluminum trays and you can also use metal trays with, with wires to help, to help them to stay in place. So we, I have some carrots drying at the moment. This is a 100 watt bulb, which is my main heat source. And this is my a fan. This is, this helps with the convection of the heater there to spread, to spread evenly throughout the box. Okay, from, okay, from cutting these carrots in its fresh state approximately how much time would it have to spend in this compartment to become the ideal uh, I guess dehydration level I would say for the carrot I would say four hours because it really depends on the moisture or the water that is in the carrots and the carrots don't have that much water inside of it so in a very short time okay could you take me through some of what you have here already uh, dehydrated yes this is mango the dried mango and this is purple this is ripe plantain and this is this is breadfruit and another breadfruit and this is plantain I like how you have them packaged. They look like if they're almost like snacks to grab and go. <laughs> okay, wonderful. This is a lovely project and I hope you continue with it. Thank you. But it's important that you first, when you cut in them, you first soak them in lime water because as you can see, an ex I did an experiment to see if you, if you don't need lime water and I tried it with banana, but it lost its color and its taste. So lime water is great for keeping the color and the taste of the fruit. You seem like an expert on this, man. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks so much. Well, this is a first. A shoe speaker. Could you take me through this project? Okay, we made this project as in to um, prevent like air, air, air injuries, like from headphones and stuff like that. So we br we brought the shoes, but we were, we're planning to bring a different style for like dancers and like people who run, and we bring it. Okay. Oh, cause of the like when you get headphones and you're running, sometimes it just fall out and it get irritating. Like so, you could get your shoes. So like when you're running, running, or uh, sometimes you're having headphones, you don't know the vehicle coming up the road, or uh, somebody behind you or something like that. So you get your shoes to play your music. Okay, for safety and uh, other things. Now, obviously, if it's going to be on your feet, it has to be very amplified. I mean. What is it like the application of something like this? Just for jogging or do you see it in like maybe a party, a shoe party? Yeah, like a fashion show or something like that. Okay, so take me through the mechanism. What is allowing it to play music from, I see you have here a tablet. What is allowing it to send the music there? It's a Bluetooth speaker, so it could connect to any device that has Bluetooth. So. Even if you want to watch like a movie on your phone and you're out, you know, you have, you connect to the, um, the speaker and this song comes back to you and it plays your music as well. So how about putting a mic there and using the speaker and a mic for doing like a conversation with your shoe? Well, <laughs> would it take about that? Ah, 
Ah, well, there you go. Somebody gave you an idea. Okay, wonderful. Very interesting. Um, thank you so much. You're viewing a presentation of the Agency for Public Information. Our program will return in just a moment. They are small and impressionable. How you interact with them is very important. So don't believe for one second that anything you do won't leave a lasting impression. The power to make a positive impression is in your hands. By playing with them, reading to them, talking and singing to them, you can help them develop positively because children are never too young to learn. This message was brought to you by the UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, the Caribbean Child Support Initiative and this station. Welcome back to our third and final presentation. A vocal training program for children, an initiative of local gospel artist Stacy Little, takes the spotlight on our final segment. Dubbed Little Voices Big Dreams, the 10-week program offers children the opportunity to improve on their vocal talent. The API's Shanna Daniel recently visited the Little Voices in session and brings us more in this report. The sound of little voices ring out of the Redemption Shops Community Center on a cool Saturday morning. No doubt a welcomed sight and sound for this area. The little voices belong to boys and girls who are part of a 10-week vocal program for children, the brainchild of local gospel artist Stacy Little. Okay, I'm gonna take three of these. Ready? One. Let's make it quick. One, two, three, and go. Right. Okay, well, Little Voices is a vocal training program for kids, and uh, it's geared to sort of give them a nudge and a push in the right direction with their gifts. Uh, just as an athlete would have to train if they're running, just so as a singer you have to train your voice in order to be, become better as a vocalist. And so this program offers exercises and different elements that would encourage your child to develop their gifts and want to develop it and, and become better at singing and at music. What's the inspiration though behind starting Little Voices? I've, I've always wanted to give back what I've learned over the years and because I never really had the opportunity when I was younger to have such a program. Yes, I've had vocal mm -hmm. training and so forth, but I don't um. think that when I was younger, if anything was offered like this and so, because of my years of experience, I want to give back what I've learned to the youths. Tell us some of the things that um, you do in that 10 weeks. Okay, well, first of all, we, we would start off with an evaluation. So these students would come and um, they would sing a song and I would see where they would need help. So each student might be weak in a particular area. Uh, one might be projection, one might be tone or key, you know, so I would, I would pinpoint, do an evaluation and see which student would need help where. Then we go right into the basic um, information uh, where your, your voice is important. We show them why is it important to train your voice, how you take care of it health-wise. Also, uh, we have the ways in which you should stand when you're singing. Uh, also, we, we deal with basic vocal warm-ups and then we go right into the training with the vocal warm-ups and exercises. Let's go. Inhale. Exhale. La. And you're squeezing all the air out, alright? Okay. 
But within the program, we have field trips. We're going to visit the police. We already did. We visited the police band room. We're going to visit a, a studio so that the children will be exposed to, you know, studio life, see how it is. And so the idea is that we could join with other programs that might, might spill off from, you know, their interest. For instance, if a student become interested in the pan, they can join a pan program and develop themselves as a, as a musician. Right. Okay, that, that's um, a good idea. Today, I noticed that you had a number of local musicians coming in and demonstrating, teaching the children about their own instrument. I, I see that they, the children were very interested in that. So you're going to go D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and D. Okay? So you're going to hear that. I'm going to play the same songs there. Do we me fast so that you do on fast the You do roll. I know some of the students play an instrument and so the idea is for them to see a professional doing what they do so that it will inspire them more to practice harder and become better and so for those who do not play an instrument that they can at least choose one of the instruments that they saw today and pick it up and try it and they never know they might become one of the best violinists in St. Vincent, you know, so it's a, it's, it's a way of building the future um, for the kids and building their gifts over time. Hi, my name is Agape Daniel and I like Little Voices because it teaches you how to sing and how to get better at singing. And one of the th things I learn in Little Voices is how to do bubbles. Bubbles? What's that? It's a part of the warm-up exercises, and it goes like <laughs> So, wh why do you do those warm-up exercises? 
It's important to do warm-up exercises because you have to exercise your throat before you sing so that uh, you won't get toast. Would you encourage other little children like yourself to be a part of it? Yes, please. Because it's because it is teaching you how to sing and how to get better at something that you're already good at. Okay. And do you want to be a singer? A rock star. <laughs> how do you think um, this will help you? Me and the two voices will help me because I sing in the church choir and for Christmas program I sang. And I want to go get better at singing. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. My name is Devian Dreams, and I like Little Voices. It teach you plenty of things that people do not know in this world. And one thing I like is like the warm up exercises, like you have to stand straight and all these kind of stuff and I love singing because I sing in church and people want me to come back but after that I didn't <laughs> so um, will you encourage other little children to join little voices yes please Why? because people need to know how to sing and stop singing out of tune <laughs> all right well thank you very much so you say you can sing you like to sing yes please tell me what is your favorite song um i have two favorite song one name when jesus says yes and one name ada oh i like when jesus says yes but you know what I usually go out of tune, so I want you to sing a little piece for me to teach me how to sing it in tune. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. Oh, like, tell me if I'm doing it as well as you or if I will need some voice lessons training from Stacy. When Jesus says yes, Nobody can say no when Jesus says yes. Nobody can say no. No, you need voice training. <laughs> you think I need voice training? Okay, tell me what time does it start? I'll have to sign up to come here. One o'clock. All right, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Adonai Daniel, and I enjoy be, being a part of. It's a voice because it helps you mature your voice. Tell me something that you have learned at Little Voices. I learned uh, elevator slides and keys to singing. Do you like to sing? I like to drum. Oh, you like to drum? Yes. Why? Because uh, it's very fun. And uh, it sounds good. Hello, my name is Jazara Mason. I like Little Voices because it helps you to train your voice to sing properly. Okay, tell me something that you learned at Little Voices. I learned how to, how to sing. How to sing? Well, how to do exercises and the keys to singing and much, much more. Wow. Are you a singer? Yes, I love to sing. Okay, what's your favorite song? My favorite song is Jehovah, you, I trust in you. <laughs> Okay, you want to share a little piece with us? Um, okay. Jehovah, you, I trust in you. Oh, Lord, Jehovah, you, I trust in you. 
I believe, I believe you are the gods of miracles. You are the gods of wonders. You are the god of powerful. I believe, I believe. Whoa, you have a beautiful voice. Tell me something. What do I need to do to get my voice to sound as sweet as yours? Go to training like me. <laughs> so I need to sign up in Little Voices? Yes, please. All right. Thank you very much, and I will do that, okay? Yes, please. All right. Where do you see this program, Little Voices, going? Ah, it says it in the name, Big Dreams. Little Voices, I, I see first of all, it going throughout the entire community here in Redemption Shops. I want to see Little Voices go throughout the other communities and then I also want to see young people who, who are a part of this program really develop and achieve their dreams big in the long run. So Stacy, before I go, let me tell you, I spoke with some of your students. They're talented little singers. Their little voices are beautiful. And I tried to sing something, but they told me that I need to be a part of this class. So <laughs> sing a line of your favorite song or something. Okay, I love this song. St. Vincent, my homeland. You gave me no mansion, no gold, no diamond, yet I love you a million. Okay, no, teach me to sing it like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, inhale, exhale. Love. Okay, Shana, sing after me. St. Vincent, my homeland. St. Vincent, my homeland. Okay, you did well. <laughs> I think that if I have five practices with you, you'll be able to make it. All right. Thank you very much. So I'll need a registration form of for course. Little Voice. Yes. All the best, Stacey. Thank, Thank you for chatting with us. Thank you very much. And on this note, we've come to the end of another Inside Story program from the Agency for Public Information. Thank you so much for viewing and for joining us. Remember, you can view this and other presentations by the API on our YouTube and Facebook page. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Dion John, has wishing you a wonderful evening and a pleasant weekend. Until next time.